Swashbucklers, you're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 186. My name is Phil Johnson. I'm your host for the show and the ship's sound guy each and every week. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling your friends, visiting sponsors, sending donations, all that great stuff that you do that helps me keep the old boat afloat. So here we are in episode number 186. Fun fact about the number 186, uh, if you're uh, listening to this, the day it comes out, yesterday was tax day. And back in the year 186 AD, peasants in Gaul staged an anti-tax uprising under Maternus, the Archbishop of Milan. Yeah, so if you're feeling like you need a little anti-tax uprising, <laughs> uh, you're in good company with the uh, with the, pe- the peasants of Gaul, Maternus. Maternus sounds like a uh, sounds like a mama's boy to me, doesn't it not? Yes. Uh, did you do your taxes? Did you get them done? Did you get? I hope you got them done like weeks ago. Did you don't want to be smashing it in right on the fifteenth? Uh, you don't want to be filing for that extension and dragging it out into the summer. That's no fun. Uh, I did mine a few weeks ago. My taxes are never fun. Uh, being the self-employed gent that I am, I gotta dole out. I gotta write a big check. Big, big check every year, and it's never a good time. Strangely, my girlfriend's refund, almost the same amount as the amount that I had to pay out. So apparently we are a zero-sum household. And I was like, can I just give her the money? I can just Venmo her the money. Why, we got to send it to D.C., and then they're just going to send it right back to her. So, but uh, the government didn't go for that. Um, But uh, she gets to pay for uh, her her part of the Italian trip later this uh, fall with her tax uh, refund. Not me, not me. I got to go out and earn some more money. My guest on the show today is Reese Miller, aka Wolfbeard O'Brady of the Dread Crew of Oddwood. Yeah, how long we've been waiting to get this show together, right? It's been quite a while, and uh, it's a great talk. You're going to enjoy it. We're going to talk about uh, how they came together over a video game. Uh, we're going to talk about the crazy drum kit they use and how that comes about. We're going to talk about why they decided to stick to their guns on staying an acoustic band in a metal world that they're playing in, uh, how they started playing in Europe, all sorts of good stuff in this talk, and you are really going to dig it. If you are uh, digging the show, and I hope you are, come on over to Facebook, facebook.com slash under the crossbones. Leave us a little commenty thing there. Jump in on the chats we're having. Uh, If you, Twitter, Twitter, we're on the Twitter too, twitter.com slash under crossbones. No the in that was too long. And of course, you can hit the subscribe button Whatever app you're listening to this uh, on right now, just hit that subscribe button and you will get the brand new episodes every Tuesday right out the gate so that when I talk about things that happened yesterday, they'll make sense. I mean, not that I'm, I have, I, I, I subscribe to all of the podcasts I listen to too, and I'm always at least a month behind. So if you're a month behind, if you're listening to uh, stuff from March right now, that's cool. Well, you're not listening to stuff from March right now because you're listening to this right now which is in April, which means you've caught up, but now it's probably May. So, ooh, time travel. I'm getting confused. And, of course, you can get all the show notes for this episode at underthecrossbones.com slash 186. Uh, as I'm recording this, right now I'm uh, I'm looking at the news, uh, watching Notre Dame burn in Paris, uh, which is heartbreaking. Is it not? Uh, I, I was fortunate to visit the Notre Dame last year. And whether you're a, a religious person or not, I, I'm not. And uh, it is a, a shame to see something that is, you know, over 700 years old burning into the ground. And I hope it was an accident. I hope there was nothing nefarious uh, behind it. Uh, but yeah, heartbreaking just to see the spire go over. Mm. I'm going to be looking at my vacation photos uh, later this evening to to kind of remember uh, being there. Uh, the, my, my one uh, particular... Uh, memory of visiting Notre Dame was when going into the bell tower, you have to uh, go through this little sort of, um, it's not a triangular doorway, but like the top of it is triangular and you have to kind of, you have to bend over to go in this thing. And I was wearing a backpack at the time and I got stuck in the doorway going to the bell tower. And I was like, if I got stuck going into this doorway to the bell tower with a backpack on, uh, that invalidates the entire premise of the hunchback of Notre Dame. (laughs) Because uh, he wouldn't have been able to get through. He had a fleshy backpack on. He would not have been able to get through this door either. So that kind of ruined the book for me. But uh, it was a, a, just a beautiful, beautiful place. And I'm sorry to see what's happening to it. And I don't I don't know what they'll do with it. Uh, it's it's super fresh. I mean, just like 45 minutes ago, the news came out about that. So uh, crazy stuff. But on, on lighter news and a, a, uh, a, a trash heap of a fire, I don't know if you've watched the, the Motley Crue movie on Netflix called The Dirt. 
um, or if you're a Motley Crue fan, even if, if uh, I don't want to say it's worth watching if you're not a Motley Crue fan, because it probably isn't. Uh, I've heard the the book was good, The Dirt. I haven't read the the book itself. Uh, the movie is ridiculous. <laughs> it's it's just it's ridiculous. If you want to just see excess on Netflix, uh, as if there's not other things where you can, if you want to see sort of all right done uh, excess. Uh, with some old Motley Crue songs in it, then watch the dirt. Uh, I'm about I'm about halfway through it, and and uh, uh, seriously considering not watching the rest of it, but uh, I will. I like the songs. I I, I was a Motley Crue fan from way back. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, if you, I'll tell you, I'll give you a better option. Better option: read uh, uh, the Heroin Diaries, a book which was uh, Nikki Six's book, uh, the Heroin Diaries, and there's an album. That goes with it, also called The Heroin Diaries by 6 a.m. Uh, that book is amazing, and the album is fantastic. It does not sound like Motley Crue. It's a rock record. It doesn't sound like Motley Crue, but uh, listen to The Heroin Diaries album. Read The Heroin Diaries book. That is totally worthwhile. That was uh, some some scary stuff, some fast, fascinating music. It's really great stuff. Uh, meanwhile, making music of my own, uh, back on the road this week a little bit. Uh, April the 19th, that is this Friday. I'll be headlining at the Dargenzia Winery in Santa Rosa, California. All sorts of little rock and roll references this week. Uh, the Dargenzio family connected to Randy Rhodes, yeah, who was Ozzy Osbourne's guitar player when he first went solo that uh, tragically died in a, in a plane crash. But, uh, yeah, the Dargenzio family connected with Randy Rhodes. I think they do like a Randy Rhodes wine of some sort. But anyway, I'll be playing the Dargenzio Winery in Santa Rosa on April 19th. April the 25th, I'll be at Flappers Comedy Club in Burbank, California. And I have discount tickets for that. I have a link to discount $5 tickets for that. And that'll be in the show notes. So just click on through the show notes. There'll be a link to get the discount tickets. Uh, It's only good for a few days, so make sure you jump on that. But it's just $5 tickets to see me at Flappers Comedy Club on April 25th. On April 26th, I'll be making a quick stop into the Ventura Comedy Club in Ventura, California. On the 27th, I'll be at the Comedy Palace in San Diego, California. And this is a uh, a test run gig, a short test run gig uh, for my comedy special filming that will be happening there in August. So if you want to put August 16th on your calendar right now, that is the date that we have uh, set for the filming of my next comedy special, which might be called Burning Sensation. Not sure yet, but that's kind of my front runner title at the moment. And then April the 28th, I'll be at the Van Nuys Comedy Club in Van Nuys, California. So those are the dates. Uh, you can go to underthecrossbones.com, click on the tour dates button to find out where I'm telling jokes and singing songs near you. I'm on out. It's going to be fun. Uh, I will be uh, uh, just, I'm thinking for it in the calendar in October uh, during the Fort Myers Pirate Festival. I will be playing at the Laugh In Comedy Club in Fort Myers that weekend, headlining the whole weekend. And uh, so if you're going to the Fort Myers Pirate Fest, uh, put Laugh-In Comedy Club Phil Johnson on your calendar as well. I'll be hanging around the fest. You'll see me there. But you can come see me tell jokes in the evening after the festival's closed at the Comedy Club. All right? So put that on. Uh, we're sponsored today by T Public. T Public does cool things. They make uh, they hook up with uh, T-shirt artists, and they sell the, t- the T-shirts. And when you buy a T-shirt, the artist gets a cut. Uh, T Public gets a little cut, I get a little cut, and everybody wins because you get an awesome T-shirt. And I have personally curated over 100 super cool pirate T-shirts, funny ones, sexy ones, scary ones. You need another pirate T-shirt, right? You don't have enough of them because you never do. I never do. I need more pirate T-shirts. And there are some super awesome ones on T Public. So go do this, underthecrossbones.com slash shirt. Just go to underthecrossbones.com slash shirt. You can see the over 100 super cool pirate t-shirts that I have handpicked for you. All right? Again, underthecrossbones.com slash support. Nope. Slash shirt. <laughs> ah, look at that. I got ahead on my notes a little bit. Slash support is where you go if you want to make a donation to the show. Or click that Amazon banner. Buy yourself something nice. Amazon kicks me back a few shekels. Uh, or if you want to be a sponsor of the show too, all that information is there. That's underthecrossbones.com slash support. All right, so let's do this. You ready for some Dread Crew Oddwood action? Yeah, of course you are. So let's do this. This is Reese Miller, a.k.a. Wolfbeard O'Brady of the Dread Crew of Oddwood. <laughs> So uh, I've been listening to your stuff all morning, uh, which is always fun. It's a it's a good morning music, strangely. <laughs> That's the first time <laughs> I've heard that, but I'm okay with it. It gets you it gets you in the mood, gets you a little pumped up. I like it. But for the people out there who ha- are unfamiliar with the Dread Crew of Oddwood, how would you describe what you guys do? 
Well, we're a self-described, uh, our, our genre is a self-described heavy mahogany. And that's, um, I like it. It's, uh, you know, a simple play on words that happened once at a show. And we're like, Hey, that kind of worked out. Let's, let's make that a thing. Let's make that what we do. <laughs> so we, we call ourselves heavy mahogany, but for the, the people who are unfamiliar with us, we are, uh, acoustic heavy metal with like a celtic influence okay so do you generally uh, in a, in the, the larger genre sense do you fall into kind of the folk metal scene is that where you end up we like a lot of folk metal bands and we are paired with them but uh, we don't have like a genre direction that we're like aiming for it's just right now that pairing makes sense and we have a lot of fun playing with those bands right yeah and i don't think any band actually shoots for a particular genre you just kind of everybody else goes hey let's put them with over the here with these guys i think yeah folk yeah. metal folk metal works then okay all right cool so now you guys work all acoustic which anything attached to the word metal is it's, it's foreign territory so what was the decision like to stay with just acoustic instruments and not go not go Bob Dylan electric as I said. <laughs> <laughs> not like the Beatles and their goddamn electrical guitars. <laughs> yeah. No, um we uh we've always done acoustic since the beginnings of this this project and uh it just doing anything otherwise just felt inauthentic to what we had started. Okay. Well, let's felt- go back to the beginning of that story a little bit then. How did you, how did where does the band come from? How did you guys get it together? Well, uh, like, of course this was, you know, several lineups ago, uh-huh. but, um, we all met at a, a crazy video game convention, uh, like a little nerdy get together, uh, that was okay. like, themed heavily towards echo the dolphin. Okay. And, uh, and a lot of us happened to be musicians. So we're huh. like, well, what can we, what can we do with this? And we kind of got, most of us were playing in metal bands at the time, uh, or, you know, rock bands, whatever, 18, 19 year old versions of us were doing. And, uh-huh. uh, but I played accordion and, um, somebody, I, I happened to be at a Renaissance fair with said accordion. And I was okay. just on the street kind of jamming. Like I say street, it's, you know, a little path in this sad little festival somewhere in California. <laughs> um, and, uh, somebody said, Hey, you're, you're quite good at that. Would you like to perform at the next one of these? And I was like, I'll, I'll one up you. I'll bring a whole band. And so uh-huh. I talked to these guys, met, some of which I knew from high school, some I just met at this crazy little convention and um yeah we brought a whole band and since then it's just kind of never stopped okay so i've never heard of echo the dolphin um what you've never heard of echo the dolphin (laughs) i'm also not much of a gamer so that would explain that but when you when you uh, gather a bunch of people around a uh the 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 love of a video game like that how likely or unlikely is it that first of all you'd all be musicians and that you'd all be decent enough musicians to start playing together well it was um it was a very very once in a lifetime opportunity i guess um like i said some of us were friends from beforehand we uh, i went to high school with a couple of the original members of of okay. the band and uh everyone else like to be perfectly honest some of them weren't musicians <laughs> okay all right <laughs> <laughs> and we're just I played like with well, those guys too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's okay. It's uh, you know, we we created something fun out of it. The first first year or two of Oddwood shows were, you know, it was a very much a let's just see what happens. Let's see these nine or between seven and nine dudes all crash the stage and try to play a song and see how well it comes out on the other end. And uh, we just got better and better as time went on. And some of us. You know, we we act we started taking it seriously kind of after we realized that people wanted to see us perform, uh-huh. and uh, and yeah, this was this was ten years ago, so <laughs> the the details are are a little lost on me. Oh yeah, no, I get that, uh, and and uh, uh, I understand the whole the the personnel churn that happens in a band like that too. As soon like you said, as soon as you start to take it seriously, some people go, oh oh, we're doing this seriously. Oh, that wasn't what I planned for. Right, they're like. Well, I mean, it all started just because somebody would give us some cash and, you know, we were, we were barely, barely done being teenagers. Uh huh. And so we jumped at the chance to, to perform music prof- professionally, I say in air quotation marks. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, it just has been going ever since, like performing acoustically at Renaissance and, uh, Renaissance fairs and, um, local, 
like local street fairs, like busking on the street and even stuff like county fairs. Like we've always, the, the foundations of this band were always acoustic. It was okay. just whatever we could bring to a space with no microphones, no amplifiers, no power, no like, like no AC power and just create a show around that. And because that was how we started, we've never, we felt that adding an electric guitar or even like, you know, like a heavy sounding bass or even like a drum set, like a traditional sounding, like normal, like hi hat, snare, rack toms, drum set. We don't even use that. Um, uh huh. We we started with this weird thing, and to do anything that betrays that original spirit just feels out of character for me. So that original idea, that original vision, uh, how did pirates come into it, and and what else did that original vision look like, and how closely are you still adhering to that? Well, it was a it became a pirate thing because we were at a Renaissance festival and I was playing an accordion and I was like, this doesn't okay. quite line up historically, but mm. I can kind of tweak it if we play up the pirate thing. Um, if we and I, to be perfectly honest, I like yourself have had a fascination with the whole concept of like you know brigands on the high seas since I was young. Uh-huh. So I had a pirate costume. I <laughs> I had that when I was you know in high school, and uh, and we've because the band formed around me at that time, it just made sense for everyone else to kind of, you know, go to the old thrift store and pick up what they could that looked piratey and uh, okay. see if we could pass for a band like that at these festivals. So then musically, how, what's the evolution looked like besides just better musicianship and maybe cycling out the people who weren't musicians in the first place. How has the sound changed over the years? Um, we definitely started more on the traditional, like, pirate sing song side of things. Okay. So like, you know, just uh, even stuff like songs like Patty lay back or, um, traditional sea shanties like John Kanaka or any of those older, everyone joins in, sings a big chorus. And then one person kind of takes a, a lead. Um, that was kind of how we started. And we just peppered that with, uh, with songs that we liked and uh, were more melodic. So like more like the, like tunes, like fiddle tune. Okay. Like Irish tunes that you hear at a session. Sure. Um, so we'd kind of pepper those together. And then every once in a while we'd be like, well, let's, you know, let's play a flogging Molly song. Let's play a dropkick Murphy song. <laughs> let's play some punk rock that kind of sort of fits the genre. Right. Um, and uh, as time went on, it got more and more on that kind of rock punk side of things. And Eventually it became a little bit more metal, but it's kind of hard to, at the beginning it was, it was hard to take those instruments and play metal riffs on them in any convincing way. And uh-huh. it took a lot of time and a lot of, a lot of practice just kind of sitting with those instruments before we kind of nailed down that sound. And that's gotta be an interesting process because as I was listening to this stuff again today, I was like, these are totally metal riffs. You've got all the little melodic fills, all that kind of stuff that belongs in there. and the accordion really takes up a lot of that mid range space that an electric guitar would. Exactly. What do you, what kind of things did you have to learn and adapt to do in order to make the, the accordion sound more metal? <laughs> well, <laughs> the accord, like electric guitar is like, at least sonically is kind of a wash. It kind of right. just fills everything from like, you know, like 80 Hertz to like two K like it just, right totally fills that space and the accordion's kind of similar just in how it responds to like the human ear like it fills uh-huh. a lot of frequencies and uh so for that reason it just at li- at shows it just filled the space a lot better than like an acoustic guitar or a whistle or you know any of those other things so it just kind of laid it became the like riff machine like that was what like we structured the songs around that instrument not because it's a better instrument or i was the best player simply because sonically that instrument fills an acoustic space so much better and Mm -hmm. what i had to do was you can't do like power chords on a keyboard instrument it just doesn't sound right like having right fifths all over the place just kind of sounds sloppy so i needed to get it simple enough so that you could hear the runs so that you can uh-huh. h- hear like the sort of metal style riffs or, or chords or whatever you want to call it. And then um, I also wanted to fill in the, the, the low mids with my left hand. 
So, okay. I mean, really, all I needed to do was learn to play the accordion. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I mean, like any 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 accordion worth of salt can do what I do, um, but uh, but yeah, just getting it up to speed, um, playing along with like you know rancid songs, uh, Motorhead okay. songs was like definitely something that I did in the beginning to kind of get more of a, a feel for it. But it's not just me that's had to kind of adopt a, a weird approach. Like all of us have our. Uh, uh-huh. Our string players, we had an acoustic guitarist for a very long time. He always said that he tried to play acoustic guitar as if he was playing a motorhead drum set. Okay. Just to fill that, that as much space as they could with every instrument. Like every, I always like to tell people in, in, in how we do music, everyone's always fighting to be heard. Everyone's always uh-huh. fighting to be loud. And like, it's, there's a little bit of a dance where there's, you know, people, some person takes a lead here. Somebody takes takes a back seat in this section, but like for the most part, we are always trying to play as loud as we can. <laughs> and at first it was just to be heard in an acoustic setting, but it right. kind of transcended that into how we play music. So like our mandolinist has to fight for that and has to like learn to play in a way that is not necessarily a, a traditional mandolin aspect. Um, right. As does, as do all of our, our string players, our, our poor bassist has to play hard as hell to, to be heard over all that <laughs> yeah i'm sure yeah uh yeah the idea of loud mandolin is is uh a strange thing to think about yeah in the first is. place so because i mean it's such a quiet instrument even when i play it's like i mean you always have to crank the gain uh, you know on the uh on the recording system to get it to even register anything so that's interesting now tell me about the the drum kit because as i was listening to i was like i realized that the drums are it's not a traditional drum kit. It doesn't sound like a traditional drum kit, but it's played like a traditional drum kit. So tell yeah. me what's going on there. So the whole idea was to create a drum set that we could carry around to multiple locations at these festivals. Okay. Um, and and I, I let, let me give you some specifics because I keep saying at these festivals and it feels weird. Like we played a, um, a handful of festivals in Southern California, including the Southern California Renaissance Pleasure Fair. Uh-huh. We did um, a smaller series of fairs uh, called the Gold Coast Festivals okay. um, in Southern California. Uh, and uh, we eventually expanded to um, th- that company that does the Renaissance Pleasure Fair. They have a handful of fairs across the country. And we eventually expanded to their uh, their Bristol Festival in um, Wisconsin and then the, their New York Festival in Okay. And uh, at those festivals, there's stages all over the place. Sure. And we would be playing at, you know, sometimes as many as four stages in a single day, four to five, uh, between three to five sets a day and each in a different location. So we had to pick up all of our stuff and move it to these other locations. And (laughs) nine times out of 10, there's no amplification of any kind. So we needed to create a drum set that sounded like a drum set that we could, one person could pick up and move by himself. So the original version of that was a rack tom like a maybe like a a, a 10 inch tom on a uh-huh. floor tom huh with uh a tambourine some cymbals sticking out the side and i don't know some random percussion like goat toes or a shaker or okay. something and that was it and it wasn't because we loved that sound per se it was because that's what we could physically take with us okay <laughs> but by the time we got around to making like multiple albums and like creating this sound that that we had been working on that was that was our foundation like that was the root command and so we built off of that rather than throwing in a full drum set with like you know two basses and like six rack toms and two floor toms and like two snare like no it's just figuring out how to do more with less has been okay part of this band since the beginning and that's why the drums are so weird that's why we don't have a snare that's why we don't have a hi-hat that's why until recently, we didn't even have a kick drum. Okay. What does it look like now? Right now, it's a, it's a kick drum with two toms, uh, like a, a floor and a rack tom, like I said. And then okay. we have some rotos and some cymbals and like a cup. <laughs> that you just okay. <laughs> hit with a stick. And yeah. That's, Interesting. That's, that's the current percussion set. Yeah. And I heard the rototoms in one of the songs and I was like, wow, that is not a 
drum. That's a drum that you think of 1987 in and not 1887. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and yet somehow it fit perfectly into the sound of what you guys were doing, which I thought was really unique. Well, it's funny because uh, the, the very first time we used a sound like that, they weren't actually uh, rotos. They were timbales. Okay. And timbales are kind of this like Latin. Um, yeah. Um, and it was a pair of like, Timbales rigged for a drum set. Okay. And we just, it became so integral to what we did. It just became those fills with those, like it just became a thing that we couldn't live without. So we switched to rotos simply because they're a little bit easier to, uh, to mount. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. It's a really interesting sound. And just the way that um, it's produced on the albums, it just feels uh, organic to the rest of the instrumentation, where sometimes when it's an acoustic band, all of a sudden the drummer starts playing and you're like, oh, well, that sounds super modern against those acoustic guitars. Right. And some some bands can really pull it off. Um, yeah. The whole like dichotomy between like the traditional sound and then they've also got like the 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 modern edge that you get in like your guitar tone or your drums or whatever. And uh, right. we definitely, we've always kind of tried to keep it on the more traditional sounding side of things anyway i see okay yeah that's cool that's cool so you're doing these renaissance fairs in southern california you're branching out to wisconsin new york places like that uh how then do you end up playing Wacken last month <laughs> <laughs> well it's as i said it's been about it's been a 10-year journey and what started with like a hobby that a bunch of you know college age kids were doing for fun on weekends kind of turned into something that well what if we could do this more full time? What if we could do this as more of a, you know, a profession even dare I say profession. (laughs) Um, And we're still not there of course, but we've been trying very hard and uh, we, uh, we branched out into Europe um, last year. No, not last year, 2017. So not quite two years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had been, we had done a handful of tours supporting um, folk metal bands Okay. And bands like Ailstorm, which are like kind of like party rock, fun pirate bands. Uh huh. Um, bands like Swashbuckle, all that, uh, the bands in the pirate scene, so to speak. Um, and we had been touring, doing those type of tours more often than the fairs just because, you know, we'd been there, we'd done that. And it's, it was fun to play to a new audience. Sure. And we, we love the people that we played to back in fairs, but there's just an energy about playing, you know, club shows that are amplified. And uh, that's definitely where we can tweak our sound to the point where we can actually control it. Right. Um, and so we've been playing a lot more of these like uh, tours with metal bands and rock bands. And uh, yeah, it's been a great time. We've uh, we've had a lot of fun playing to people in new places. So were you opening for some of those European folk metal bands when they came here and then they were assisting you in getting booked in Europe or how was that working? Um. Well, we booked uh, most of our tour through like a booking agent who was um, an independent contractor unrelated to um, unrelated to uh, some of the bands that we had played with okay. in the United States. But um, it definitely helped to have some of those bands who came over and played in the United States that we did tour with. They could go back and kind of – it helped us become recognized in that scene a little bit. Because before it was like, who the hell are these American guys like – whatever but um to like uh to, to come back and like have a a resume so to speak with like oh uh-huh. these guys have opened for some of the more popular acts it definitely made booking easier for us what do you see as the differences between that maybe not even specifically folk metal but just the the live metal scene here versus europe it's tricky because i don't want to say it's better in europe because, you know, I grew up listening to metal here and going to metal shows sure. here in California and all over the United States, really. But there is definitely a larger body of supporters in Europe. Uh-huh. They are they are less judgmental about music, which sometimes leads uh-huh. to some crazy bands that you're like, wow, this is wild. This would never have an audience in the United States. <laughs> but like... But like, that's awesome. It's just, there's a, it's more of a a level playing field over there. People generally will give any live music a shot. And even if they don't love the show, Uh they will sit and watch the show because they like the experience of watching live music. Interesting. And that absolutely bleeds over into the metal scene over there, which is why you have so many 
for lack of a better expression, cheesier metal bands in Europe than you do here. Uh, metal, okay. metal in the United States, for the most part, unless you're like, you know, Steel Panther, uh, for the most part, takes itself pretty seriously. Right. And uh, the same is not true in Europe. Okay. Uh, I've always enjoyed the bands that have a sense. I like the serious stuff too. Um, but certainly as I get older, the bands that have a sense of humor about themselves are way more entertaining. I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, of course, there's yeah. like, I mean, everyone's always going to love Mastodon. Mastodon is awesome. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it's great to see a band that can laugh at themselves and get the whole audience to laugh with them. Yeah, that's interesting. It, uh, and what I think is in, uh, even more interesting is that you were saying that people will go see music over there rather than let's go see this particular band. Because I'm sure you've seen in clubs here where the you get the audience churn where people will show up for one band and oh, then turn man. around and leave. And the next band's crowd comes in and they leave. Oh, dude, it's it's a it's a sad struggle that I'm all too familiar with. And in uh, in the comedy scene where I'm working now, and the reason I part of the reason I, I moved from music into comedy was because that was less of a thing there. People will still go see comedy, uh, not specifically a comedian. It's starting to change a little bit now. Um, but that was uh, I could go play new venues like you you were saying, you know, you'd open up new places and new audiences and things like that uh, where I couldn't play otherwise. So comedy still has a little bit of that. Um, and honestly, I want to go try it more in Europe. I've done a little bit of European uh, stuff, um, but I I'd like to see if they're how much more how much they're retaining that more there than we are here, because now it's starting to turn into a band thing here. Um, anyway, I'm rambling. Well, no, that's actually that, uh, interesting. I, I'm this is a little off topic, but I'm actually very uh, interested. Like, um, how do you think uh, do, you, do you think comedy transcends those cultural barriers that we have? Like, do you think that? The same. I mean, obviously, it'll be a little bit different because even within the United States, you got to tweak your act for different cities. Sure. But like, yeah, I feel like Europe is very, very accepting of music as a whole as just an art form. And I wonder, are they as are they similarly accepting of different types of comedy? Uh, in my experience, yes. I mean, there's you can't get away with like super specific american references sometimes right. but then at the same time sometimes you can i did uh, a show in paris last year and everybody in the audience was uh, an expat from somewhere Got and nobody was an expat from america except me and so it was a really a worldwide audience um and i had that same experience when i did the edinburgh fringe in 05 or whatever it was oh cool yeah people fringe festival is yeah. awesome right and so you're playing for people all over the world and I found that most of the stuff was pretty translatable. I mean, people like to say funny is funny. Funny is not funny. I mean, it really is uh, up to that person's specific worldview. But I find that I have to tweak it far more for American audiences from city to city than I had to tweak it going to Paris or London or Edinburgh. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I, and I hadn't even thought about that until you asked that. So um, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. That's cool. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> back on topic. Were there any particular um, spots along the way in your musical journey so far that have been responsible for a large uptick in fan base, uh, uh, number of shows, people coming out, that kind of, you know, the, the, the big break, so to speak? I mean, we haven't had a big break. We still very much, what we're doing is very much, um, it's it's very unlike bands in the scene that we're kind of, sharing uh -huh. like w the whole acoustic thing uh some people the people who love it love it but there's a lot of people that are you know they just they're like well they'll never be as powerful as another band uh sonically uh-huh and uh i like making up for that but i definitely feel like certain people it's just not their thing the you know uh the fiddly d's so to speak the the fiddly d <laughs> quick uh irish style tunes uh celtic style tunes. i shouldn't say irish celtic style tunes uh-huh um it's it's not for everybody. Why do why do you think you you ended up going more towards playing with metal bands than with playing like the flogging Mollies and the Dropkick Murphys of the world? Mostly because every one of those bands sounds like Dropkick Murphys or Flogging Molly. <laughs> okay. Like 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 and I don't I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just like those two bands, I mean, and even there are doing, you know, like the it's the young Dubliners thing or the Pogues. Like uh -huh. there are definitely some flogging Molly songs that are like, this is almost a Pogues cover. Right. And don't get me wrong. I love all these bands. I 
worship these bands. They're so cool. Uh-huh. But like just in terms of songwriting, the, all those, they, they sound very similar. And that, that whole scene for me, it takes a lot for somebody to do something different. You know who I do think is doing something different in the, in the folk punk scene is a uh, dreadnoughts. The dreadnoughts are awesome. They're, they're, they're a Canadian band. And uh, they, in my opinion, they've done some of the kind of like freshest sounding stuff. I, I'm a fan of interesting. I've not heard of them. I'll go look them up right after. Um, cause I, yeah, cause I love all that stuff too. I think it's fun. Um, it actually took me a long time to get into it. Just like in the last couple of years, I finally came around to flogging Molly and went, Oh, okay. I get it now. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. And I get for sure. They're, uh, they're, they're, um, I mean, all, all the, all these folk bands have like very limited dynamics. It's kind of like you got two or three sort of feels to a song and that's all you got on the whole album. But, um, right. Um, and that's kind of like why we liked metal just because there's a little bit more variation and, and just different approaches from the ground up. Cause I mean, like you've got bands like, um, Fintral, which are like uh-huh. this just crazy, almost like Looney Tunes metal <laughs> that's, uh, got a folk influence. And then you've got, you know, bands like El Wady, who are also in the folk metal scene, but they're much they've got a much heavier sound. And then when they do the folk thing, it seems it's kind of got this like higher fantasy traditional air to it. Um, okay. So I don't know. I, that was, it was just, there was a lot more in that, in that scene that kind of pulled us. And does the pirate theme ever feel constricting? Has it done that to you yet? Uh, it can, but you can, you can, there's infinite options within any genre and you're only as limited as you set yourself to be. So yes, every once in a while we'll be like, oh shit, we already wrote this song two albums ago. Uh, <laughs> we got to tweak it to like add a new element, but you always, there's that, that element is always, you can always find it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in there somewhere and you can take the whole pirate theme and explore it endlessly. Like even within that, like even within the tropes, you've got endless options. I mean, like, and, uh-huh. First of all, any song with a yo ho in it is immediately a pirate song. Right. <laughs> so you've got so you've got that. If not, if all else fails, you can just do that. But even within that, you've got kind of like the the old the sailor's romance of, you know, the one one side of the love equation going off to the sea and the other one has to either wait for them or go find them. You've got like uh-huh. battle, you've got uh longing for your comrades or like, you know, being uh, singing in a chorus is one. And that's one of the things that's so it feels like there's so many options because it's like, well, how many pirate songs can you write? Well, how many songs can you write about, like, you know, adventuring with a team to take on your grandest dreams? Like, that's awesome. Right. What a <laughs> uh-huh. what a great what a great like precedent to set for yourself. Is there a song that you guys have done where you felt like we are really stretching this theme to its limits and we're not sure if it's going to fly? Well, we're writing a song about a train heist, so okay, <laughs> that's kind of pirates on a train heist is a bit of a stretch. Uh, but I mean, we've also got stuff as wild as you know stealing an airship from the Nazis, or uh-huh. you know fighting in the Revolutionary War with George Washington. So we we stretch it pretty thin. Okay, and that's just yeah. kind of normal territory for us. Okay, all right, I like it, and I love the George Washington song. I was just listening to it before we started talking. I'm glad you and, enjoyed uh, it. Yeah, it's so great. I really, really like it. Uh, speaking of which, I also think Rocktopus may be the greatest album name ever. <laughs> I'm sure we're not the only ones. There's got to be more Rocktopuses out there. <laughs> but yeah, no. When we came up with it, like somebody was like, I've got it. Rocktopus. And there, somebody else was immediately like, that's fucking stupid. We can't have that be our title. And then fast forward three months and that's our title. <laughs> it were, at the time, were there eight people in the band? Uh, Seven. Seven. Ah, oh, so close. So it was an octopus with a peg leg. It was a septopus. There you go. <laughs> uh, you guys wrote a song for uh, the Assassin's Creed game. Tell me a little bit about how that came about. Oh, yes. Um, we were doing um, some promotional stuff for the when they when, when Black Flag. It was Assassin's Creed Black Flag. I think it was four, three or four. Uh-huh. And um, some of our friends who work for this uh, uh, this video production company called Corridor Digital they wanted us to be a part of one of those videos. Ah. And I think that's how we got involved because we were involved in that video. They're like, oh, there's this crazy pirate band. Well, that'd be cool if they wrote a song and uh, Penny Arcade had written some lyrics and they were going to do a little video, but they, they didn't want to do the music themselves. They wanted like, uh, like, a, like a local pirate band or, you know, 
an American pirate band to do the music for it. So they sent us over uh-huh. the lyrics and they're like, well, we want this song. We want a song for these lyrics. You have uh, 18 hours until we need to release this. Oh so we gosh. wrote, <laughs> recorded, we had to tweak the lyrics just a tiny, tiny bit just to make them fit a little bit better. So we wrote and recorded two versions to see which one to give them an option to see which one they liked better. And, uh-huh. uh, and the one that we have up now is the one that they liked. That whole thing was done literally in 18 hours. Start some from, wow. from writing to recording to mastering. Um, my head hurts even just thinking about that, <laughs> but I, I actually, I'm, I'm pretty stoked on it. Like it's one of, it's one of those songs that I still like to come back to listen to. Uh huh. Is it one that you guys perform live? Uh, we've performed it live for a long time. Um, we haven't on our most recent tour, but we also have a, basically a brand new drummer. So okay. we're just kind of, he, he's just getting all of the new inf- information under his belt. Like he, the whole discography, he hasn't, he hasn't memorized yet. <laughs> Okay, so when you bring a new drummer in, uh, there's not only learning the songs, but also learning how to play that particular kit. How does that fly? It's a uh, it's honestly, it's been a point of contention in the past because, you know, uh-huh. drummers want to do their own thing. They want to have their right. and obviously, like, of course, anyone who's going to be filling that position gets, you know, they they get to, you know, draw the line and choose things. But like I tell everybody before they get started. Uh, no snare, no hi hat. You have to work uh-huh. within limitations to achieve the same sound. And uh, yeah, sometimes it works out better than others. But um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just one of those one of those things that I think makes us who we are. All the drummers I've worked with have always been so very specific about the like if that symbol is not at exactly a thirty eight <laughs> degree angle, then the show doesn't go on. You know? Oh man, our, our drummers have had to put up with all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, like our drums are. They're they're a little bit more trash than they are drums. Um, they're right. they're like an old seventies kit that we stripped all the paint off of, and then we uh, stained it to look like crazy, and then we wrapped it in rope, and like there's just ropes and chains hanging off of it, and and it used to be strapped to a plank, uh-huh. and the whole <laughs> drum set you could just like push up on the plank like a dolly and roll it around, uh-huh. and uh, we've had to we've had to break it down just because we've been flying lately, and right, it's not a fun thing to fly with. But yeah, no, our our drummers they definitely have a they they have their work cut out for them because we 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 make it hard on them just because I we think that's that's what we are. So what's on the docket now? You guys are just back from your European tour a few weeks ago, and what are you working on next? Well, we are hard at work writing a new album. Uh, we do not have a release date for it yet, um, but uh, that's that is prime directive right now. We want to put out new material and make it as best as we can. And, um, and currently we don't have any, uh, major tours booked. Um, I think actually our next, I'm probably going to get in trouble cause this is probably wrong, <laughs> but I think our next, uh, our next gig is the Vista Viking festival in Southern California. All right. Um, in September. All right. Very cool. Where is a good place for people to keep up with what you guys are doing online? Um, the dread crew of oddwood.com has links to all the fun things, but, uh, it's probably just easier to go to our Facebook or Instagram. Okay. <laughs> um, and that's dread crew of oddwood. All right. Awesome. That's an easy name that everyone will remember how to say and spell. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, is there anything I forgot to ask you about that you want everybody to know? Nope. <laughs> all right i think i'm good man i have done my job i have done my job well fantastic man this has been really fun i've it, you know it was uh uh i heard about you guys first from uh xander kent like two and a half years ago xander's an awesome dude he's a great guy yes and uh, so i'm glad we finally got a chance to talk well thank you phil i appreciate the interview and uh, i hope that i made sense i sometimes tend to not do that <laughs> you absolutely did it was good and there it is friends that is my talk with reese miller uh aka Wolfbeard O'Brady of the Dread Crew of Oddwood. How fun was that? I know we got a little music geeky in there a few times, but uh, when you, when a musician talks to a musician, that is bound to happen. Uh, so I hope we didn't lose you anywhere in there, but uh, I was fascinated with how an accordion can take the place of an electric guitar in a metal band and totally make it work. The drum kit, craziness. Uh, most drummers I know would not hang with that. They would be <laughs> It would be very difficult for them to adapt to that. 
drummer is not always the super, super most adaptable people in the world, but uh, it's cool. So what did you like? What did you learn? Did you uh, hear something that you wanted to jump in on in the conversation? Add your two cents to what we was talking about. Uh, you can do that. Come on over to Facebook and leave a note in the conversation thread, uh, facebook.com slash under the crossbones. And of course, you can get all the show notes for this episode at under the crossbones.com slash 186. Want to find out more about the Dread Crew of Oddwood? You can do that. It's the Dread Crew of Oddwood.com. And like he said, that's got all links to their Facebook and their Instagram and all that kind of good stuff over there. You got to you gotta follow people wherever they are. Actually, what it is, you know what it is? We're trying to be wherever you are. Because uh, there are people who are like, I'm only on Instagram. I don't look at anything else. And so we do Instagram so that we can be in front of those people. And there's other people that are like, I only do Facebook. They're usually older. And uh, we get in front of those people to do the Facebook thing. So we try to be everywhere uh, because we want to be where you are. So anyway, you can find links to all their Instagram, Facebook, all that kind of good stuff at the Dread Crew of Oddwood.com. We are sponsored today, of course, by Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, WKKC DB playing the best music of today's hits and yesterday's classics, and Pirate Radio Talk, playing the best pirate shows, including Under the Crossbones, 24-7, all commercial-free. It's amazing, you guys. So good. To listen, go to Pirate Radio The Treasure Coast or pick up the Pirate Radio WKKC-DB app in your favorite app store. That's the music station. Or go to PirateRadioTC.com or pick up the Pirate Radio Talk app in the app store, and that is for the talk station, because duh. Uh, you can also ask your Alexa or Android Googly device to uh, to do the thing for you. Just just say, hey, uh, uh, not Siri, hey, Alexa. Is that Alexa, yes. Hey, Alexa, play uh, Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, and it will do that. You can also ask for Under the Crossbones. It'll do that, too. All brought to you by iTreasure Radio, the very best digital media from independently owned stations at iTreasureRadio.com. How about a little music? We gotta get a song in here, right? We're gonna listen to one right now from the Dread Crew of Oddwood. This is called Dead Man's Medley from their album Lawful Evil. Check it out.
That is our show for today. Thank you so much again for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it every time you do. To find out more about the Dread Crew of Oddwood, go to the Dread Crew of Oddwood.com. They got a bunch of stuff there, and the merch, and the tour dates, and the music, and links to all the other places where you can find them, and it is all good and fun. Uh, if you want to find out more about uh, what I'm doing, in case you want to do that, uh, you can go to philjohnsoncomedy.com. That's where all my tour dates, music, and jokes, and videos, and things are. And the show notes for this episode, under the crossbones.com slash 186. And that's it. I have, uh, I'm doing more interviews this week. They're not in the can yet, but they will be. And I've got some really fun people coming on. Uh, I will be even doing an interview in Los Angeles while I'm down there. So... I won't tell you about it yet. I don't like to jinx it until it's in the can. All right? But you, uh, get your, if you haven't done your taxes, if you just get your taxes done. Just do it and revolt after. But do your taxes first and then revolt. Because if you revolt beforehand, it's just it's messy, you know? So do the taxes. Get that done and then revolt. Uh, don't burn anything down. Please don't. And uh, I will see you next week. All right. All right.